So uh, welcome everybody. Hello, I say hello to Michael and uh, Barbara. Hello to Amy. Hello to Jill. Hello to Norma. And hello to B. I don't know who B is. And um, everybody else who's here. Today is a special day on the Chabad calendar and therefore on the Jewish calendar. And that is, today is the 20th day of the month of Av. And um, what happened on the 20th day of the month of Av? So let me pull up my screen over here. And I'll share my screen. And let's go to... There we go. Um, today in Jewish history. Today, Monday, August 10th, 20th of Av, 5780. In Jewish history... The first printing of the Zohar, the fundamental work of the Kabbalah, authored by the Talmudic sage of Hashem Bar Yochai, was published in 1558. Pretty cool. Hello, Lois. Welcome. Thank you. Hello. A little late, but I'm here. You're here. That's all it counts. That's and that's right. in 1944, the passing of Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Schneerson, 20th of August, the yard site of the Lubavitcher, his father, Rabbi Levi Yitzhak Schneerson, in Alma Ata, Kazakhstan, our believe Yitzhak was chief rabbi of Yakut Shrinislav. Wow. Currently you said that so nicely. Currently in Petrovsk and was arrested and exiled to Kazakhstan by the Stalinist regime as a result of his work to preserve Jewish life in the Soviet Union. And here's big news. Um, here it is here. U.S. Commission lauds Kazakhstan government for recognizing Rabbi Levi Yitzchak's legacy, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Schneerson's grave declared a heritage site. So this is the representative of the United States, together with the representative from Almata, which is the city where the Rebbe is, Rebbe's father is buried. And so um, he was physically tortured, and spirit, but, but spiritually unbroken in his government imposed exile in Almaty, Kazakhstan, where he is buried. And so um, we'll talk about him in just a moment. I just want to get to the part where, uh, there it is, representatives of the governments of the United States and the former Soviet Republic of Kazakhstan gathered formally designated the a Kazakh National Heritage Site. Attending the program in Almaty was Paul Packer, the chairman of the United States Commission uh, for the preservation of America's heritage abroad, together with local officials, including Almaty Mayor Bakistan Sagintayev. On behalf of the United States, Packer stated that he was honored to announce alongside officials from the Summit of the Day, we now proclaim the Holy Resting Site an official heritage site. The U.S. Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad was created in 1985 in response to the overwhelming need that followed the Holocaust decades of communist rule. So they made this uh, commission to protect and preserve these sites in other countries. And But this rabbi never, never had a connection to the United States, really. No, but the rabbi, but the rabbi is. And they just published, actually, interesting, I ordered the book. So when I get it, I will, uh, I'll share it with you and show you what it is. But um, this, the... The Kazakhstan. Hello, Latifa. Welcome. The um, the people from uh, from Kazakhstan. The Kazakhstan government actually published a book about the Rebbe together with Chabad. They published a book um, about the Rebbe. So this way, when people come to Kazakhstan, they can find out about. I'm sorry, Ukrainian people. Sorry, not Kazakhstani people. Ukrainian people. Uh, published a book about the Rebbe, and uh, and uh, they're taking, they want to get, they want to, um, I don't want to say cash in, but they want to also, you know, get some, uh, you know, bring some tourism or, uh, you know, interest in the fact that there's a famous rabbi by the name of uh, the Rebbe who actually grew up in Ukraine. And uh, they want to do the same in Almaty. Is uh, obviously with this was this was orchestrated by Chabad, um, trying to make this into a, a heritage site. 
but uh, the Kazakhstan people are, uh, are also wanted to be a heritage site and recognizing that um, it has a special place in the Jewish, in the Jewish world. So who was this man and why would why does he deserve to have this? So for that, I'd like to uh, pull up a little bit of his biography. And let's go here. Let's go a brief biography. <laughs> and here it is. So um, you can read most of it on your own. I'm just going to go through some. Uh, here is a picture of the Rebbe, of the Rebbe's father. Um, now, the Rebbe's father is a, di a direct descendant of the fifth Chabad Rebbe. So he himself is, um, you know, comes from the, that's why his name is Schneerson. He's actually from that family. And he was an extraordinary young boy, young man. And he, was, he became a, he, would, he had mastered Kabbalah, Talmud, Hasidic philosophy. And he actually went around and was ordained as a rabbi by many different rabbis. So that was the thing. If you were really like a, like, like a prodigy, you wouldn't just get, you wouldn't just get uh, ordained by one rabbi. You'd go around from rabbi to rabbi and get multiple ordinations, which he did get. Uh, then he got married to Rebetz and Chana Yanovsky, which was a very, very well-known chassid. And um, so it was a beautiful wedding between these uh, two very special families. And the Rebbe was their oldest. Then they had a son, Dov Bear, who unfortunately uh, had um, health issues, Zoom mental health issues. Zoom and up Zoom meeting. Being, Zoom meeting. Ended up needing to be um, uh, institutionalized Zoom and was murdered by the, by the Nazis. Zoom meeting. Zoom meeting. Sadly, and so the, the, um, the he was unfortunately killed by the Nazis. Their uh, their son Dover, their son Yisrael Arulev, uh, ended up in in England, and he was a uh, you know, he was a great mathematician. Unfortunately, he passed away at a young age. He he his mother outlived her her son Dover and Yisrael Arulev. Um, obviously, we know the Rebbe. That's a picture of him when he was at the age of two. Um, he became this the rabbi of Yekaterinoslav, which is today Dnepropetrovsk, which is a very, very. It was a. It was like a very, very modern city. It was there were a lot of uh, intellectuals there, and um, here's an example: Sergei Pavlov Fale. Uh, he was a, one of the respected members of the Zionist movement. Uh, was there. Um, there was a um, Menachem Yusishkin, who was the secretary of the First Zionist Congress, and um, he was the leader in that city for 32 years until they, the Russians finally, uh, the, the Ukrainians, finally sent him to uh, Almaty, and uh, he was there for five years and passed away because of the way he was treated there, and lack of food, lack of uh, health, um, health things, and he passed away there. Um, now, the, the Rebbe's father was the most, I mean, he was like a Schneerson. He, he was a Schneerson. And the Schneersons have a, uh, such a strength of character to them. And he was given this position of one of the biggest, most influential cities and, uh, in, in Ukraine. And he basically stood up against the, the Soviets, just like the previous Rebbe did in Russia. He was doing that in the Ukraine. And um, he held up such a strong fight against the, against, the, against the Ukrainians. And there was little they could do against him until finally they, they were able to, unfortunately, take him out and uh, eventually take, take his life. But he was fearless. He was not afraid of them. Uh, they invited him to a conference early on to try to get him to agree and sign that, uh, that Judaism should really be, should be changed and should not be a, um, uh, should not be a, um, you know, the way it's practiced for many, many years. They wanted to change the way it was being practiced. And uh, the Rebbe was there at the, at the convention. Everybody else was invited there. They were told, they were warned beforehand that they better go along with the government or face severe consequences. And when they got there, they told their Rebbe to sign, and the Rebbe said, I'm not signing anything. 
it's against the Torah, it's against Judaism and all the other rabbis, um, seeing all the other rabbis seeing the Rebbe's strength of character and his, not, his, willing, his unwillingness to bend to the pressure, they all agreed. And they all said we're not going to sign. And the whole conference basically fell apart. So um, the, the, from the very beginning, the Russians, uh, the Ukrainians, were having a really, really hard time with, uh, with Reb Leibich. Uh, he fought for kosher. He fought for, all, fought for all the standards, high standards of, of Judaism in his community. And many of the rabbis said, you know, you don't represent us. You're Orthodox. You're Chabad. You, don't rep- you can't represent the entire community. And they tried to get him thrown out. So the, Re- the Rebbe's father met with them and uh, won them over. Each one individually won them over. While, and they all said, while we don't necessarily agree with you, we didn't change our opinions, but we, we like you as a person, and therefore we are not going to be fighting against you. And that is the reason why the Rebbe could not, the Russians could not, or the Ukrainians could not take the Rebbe out. Because the way they did it was they, they had informants, informers who would, who would, who would be there. But nobody wanted to inform on him. It was just uh, so. So he he he, had, he really endeared himself to all the people in the city because you would think in a city as big as uh, the Nekrovitsk with thousands and thousands of Jews, one of the biggest cities of Jews in, in Ukraine, uh, that 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 they wouldn't find enough people who would tattle on him and go to the, the you know, KGB agents. The one story that stands out is. It was uh, late at night. It was about uh, 9, 30, 10 o'clock, and he gets a knock on the door. He opens the door, and there's a woman there, and she comes in, and she says, in two hours at midnight, my son is going to come here with, um, is, is, uh, with, with, his, with his new uh, with his bride, and they need to get married. They need to get married um, by Jewish law. He's like, okay. So within two hours, he has to come up with a minion. He has to come up with 10 men. Uh, and, and, and do this in a way that uh, he doesn't get caught because you're not allowed to make Jewish weddings. You're not allowed to, you were allowed to, in the former Soviet Union, you were allowed to practice your own Judaism, but by law, you were not allowed to teach anybody else. You were not allowed to practice for anybody else. So if you want to get married yourself, that's fine, but you were not allowed to make a gathering. So doing that was absolutely illegal. So what did he do? He went and found eight, he found eight Jews and they gathered in his apartment together with the uh, himself and the and the and the groom. There were a total of nine, so they needed one more. So in the in the Rebbe's in the Rebbe's father's apartment building, so they they would always whenever they would have a high profile person, they would they would they would put a, a KGB agent in the building. So they found a young Jew. And they put him in that building to observe and to report back to them on his, uh, you know, on, on, on his activity. So the, so here they need one more for the minion, and he's Jewish. So the Rebbe send, the Rebbe's father sends somebody downstairs and says, uh, "Go tell him to come, uh, to come upstairs. We need him." So they knock on the door at twelve at midnight and tell this guy to come upstairs. He comes inside, and the Rebbe's father tells him, uh, "We need you for the minion." We're making, I'm doing a wedding here, which is obviously illegal, and you're the KGB agent, but I need you for the minion. So the guy's mouth drops, his face turns white. You know, he's just, oh, my goodness. You know, he's the guy who's supposed to be enforcing and making sure that this doesn't happen. And not only is it happening, he's making it happen. So what he does is he quickly runs around the room and closes all the blinds so that nobody could see that he's participating in this. And he participates in it. Uh, unfortunately... Um, you, you know, this was this was something that uh, that they were looking to catch him on, and they would they brought this uh, you know months later they brought this guy in to testify against the Rebbe's father, and this guy said I did not see anything unusual happen in the building, so he he completely turned around and was not a very good uh, KGB agent, but that but that 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 risk that 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 courage and bravery. To, to go and bring the, the you know the person who's who's looking at who's supposed to their job is to uh, to look after you to do that is just um, you know just very very telling about the Rebbe's about the Rebbe's father. So the Rebbe's father, I have a couple of pictures here I want to show you. Let me bring these up. Um, I want to thank my daughter Hannah for putting this together for me. 
But uh, that's the Rebbe's father. This is the Rebbe's mother, Rebbe Tzimchana. Uh, she was actually my mother's neighbor when my mother was growing up in Crown Heights. Because when she, she made it out of, uh, after her husband passed away, she made it out of, um, of, the, of Kazakhstan and she made it to France. And the Rebbe went and picked her up and brought her back to America in 1947. And she passed away, I believe, in 1965. 1964? I think 1964. Uh, end of 64, I think she passed away. And this is a, a picture of the books that the, that, Rebbe, that the Rebbe's father had while he was out in, um, in Kazakhstan. And because he was considered a counter-revolutionary, he was considered a um, very, very dangerous a revolutionary person who was, who was rebel, rebelling against the, the government. So therefore, he was banned from uh, having any writing material because they didn't want him to be able to send his terrible uh, messages and get to have them spread all around, uh, all around Russia or former Soviet Union or the world. And so therefore, they didn't allow him to have any paper and pen. Now, Reblevik was someone who spent most of his time studying Torah, and he lived, the Torah was his life. He was a, an, an incredible, incredible scholar. And the worst thing for him was not to be able to, uh, to study and not to be able to write. So his wife, Rebbe Zanchana, she risked her life, and she actually went and spent this time with her, with, his, with her husband, because she wanted to take care of him. So she went to take care of him, and um, while she was there, she realized that he needs to be able to write. So what did she do? She went out into the fields, and she would, she would find these either leaves or berries, and she would crush them up, cook them up, and turn them into uh, ink. And then he would take this little pen, and he had no paper. So what he did was he had a couple of books that they let him take with him. He wrote on the margins. He literally wrote on the margins of uh, Later on, they actually allowed him to have paper after a couple of years of being in this uh, terrible exile. And so um, his wife, Rebbe Zimchana, after he passed away, she risked her life and smuggled all of these books and all the papers out. Uh, unfortunately, most of it never made it to, may never made it out, but she was able to take some of it out and bring it to America, and it was published, and the Rebbe was very, very, very excited and happy. It's very, very dense, very difficult, because it's very esoteric, very high level, and you have to be a real great scholar to understand anything the Rebbe is saying. This is the actual picture of the, where the Rebbe's father is buried. They made a special uh, place for him in this cemetery. As you can see, it's way overgrown and not very well maintained, but the Rebbe's father's grave is more maintained there. And for many years, Kazakhstan was not very friendly to the Jewish people, but that today, as you see, they made it into a heritage site, so obviously they're working together with the Jewish community. Uh, that is actually Yaakov, our son Yaakov, who's there by the Rebbe's father's grave, Rebbe Yitzvah. Uh, last year, my classmate, and who's, uh, thank God, is doing very well in business, he sponsored a whole bunch of people to fly out to uh, to fly out there. He did the same thing again this year. So there's a whole group of, uh, of young people there. Obviously, they got masks and, uh, and doing all of that. But this is last year when there was no need for masks or anything like that. So our son Yaakov won the, uh, the raffle, and we are, he'll never forget that trip. To, uh, to it, was, it was a 24-hour round trip in and out of uh, Kazakhstan. I think he was there for a couple of hours max in the, in the country. Now, in the city of Yakutrinoslav, which is the place where the Rebbe was raised and the Rebbe grew up, this is the largest Jewish center in the entire world. It's called the Menorah Center. It's made like a menorah. You can see it from, uh, from the sky. Planes fly over. These, these beams of light shine into the sky. I don't know what the size is, but this is a Mongo Jewish center. It's the largest one in the entire world. It's a Chabad center in the Rebbe's city where the Rebbe was born. That's the Rebbe when he was born. This is the pogroms in uh, 1906 that, um, that really affected the Jews in Ukraine. The Rebbe and his family, the Rebbe's father, had to go into hiding while the, uh, while the 
the, the uh, terrible uh, groups of, of uh, gangs were going around and killing people and destroying, uh, destroying things. Uh, you've all heard of the famous Mendel Bayless story, Ooh. where he was put on trial for the for the um, killing of of a for the killing of a um, you know for the killing of uh, of, a, of a Christian boy putting his blood in the matzah. So this is mm -hmm. in 1912. There was a blood libel in Kiev. Well, it's pretty easy to see it now. And uh, it was the well, lady is not to put on the defense so to defend against, against this uh, terrible, terrible blood libel. And then was, this is uh, World War I, which obviously affected Ukraine. This is the, um, the refugees that, had to, that, were, that were coming in. And then there was the pandemic. And then, of course, there was the revolution in uh, in the former Soviet Union. Station I found on Wikipedia. And uh, Rabbi, can you please mute everybody? Who's on? It's it's. Uh... Thank you for muting yourself. Thank you. Uh, this is the terrible famine that they had in uh, in Ukraine. As you can see, these are distended uh, stomachs of these kids here. There were a lot, a lot of terrible tragedies that uh, the Rebbe's family lived through in those years. So it wasn't like uh, his life was very good until he was finally uh, exiled. It was difficult even before then. Uh, this is during the, uh, this is obviously in America, but this is the, 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 the flu. It's called the Spanish flu, but really it's not the Spanish flu, it was the pandemic. In, uh, in those in those early years, the 1918 19, to 1920, and uh, of course this is uh, the Holocaust in uh, 1939 with the taking over of the Jewish shops and, and putting all of those things on there. So this is the um, so the uh, the Rebbe's father was a uh, an incredible an incredible person, and today is his yard site. The Rebbe, out of respect for his father, even though he did not see his father uh, for many years, I don't think since 19, I think 1926, I don't know, I have to look this up, but 1926 might have been the last time that he saw his father um, because, the, uh, because of the rules in, um, in, in the former Soviet Union, they weren't allowing any, anyone to travel out of the country, and the Rebbe obviously wasn't going to go back into this former Soviet Union, they wouldn't let him, let him out, and so his parents were stuck in the Soviet Union, and he went, the, the Rebbe had already left and gone to uh, Berlin, and then went to France, so uh, they didn't see each other, and the Rebbe would be reunited with his mother, but that would be years later. So it was a very, very difficult, challenging life that he had, but his conviction and his uh, fight for Judaism is absolutely inspiring and keeps and continues to inspire us to this very day. And obviously, uh, the Rebbe grew up with his parents. They uh, were incredible people, so he learned from the best. He grew up in a, simil in a similar kind of uh, environment, like a Chabad house, a Chabad center kind of environment, where the people who lived in the city were not Chabad people. He grew up with uh, with. Um, all different types of Jewish people, from the most secular to the most religious, all living in the same city, all under the same uh, uh, roof, in a sense. And he watched how his father and mother embraced all those people. And so, in a sense, the Rebbe got his the, the idea of of where Chabad was going to go. He got that from living in his, in his parents' home and seeing it firsthand, and then translating that into making it into a worldwide. Um, experience for Jews all around the world, they would have the same experience that his parents gave to Jewish people in Yakut Tunislav or the Nepr Petrovs from uh, 1903 till um, 1939. So that's, there are many, many, many stories. We can go on all night, but that's the story of, of um, of the Rebbe and his father, and the Rebbe would always make a Fabrengen in honor of his father on this day. So the Rebbe really brought his father in.
And to me, partially, partly, uh, the Rebbe did not have any children. And the Rebbe knew that if he didn't you know, make his parents part of the Hasidic world, then no, there would be no one to really honor them. And so by in this way, he's truly honoring them by making sure that there were people who would remember them and would honor them. And so it's really very special that we have, we've, we've come to know the Rebbe's parents in such a beautiful way, thanks to the Rebbe making such a big deal about them and introducing us to them uh, in, in a very, very beautiful way. Um, I'm going to go to... This, okay. So, for today, we're going to go back to the Tanya that we have been studying. I also wanted to remind you all that tomorrow night, instead of the uh, Torah class, we're going to be doing the history of Jewish music. But I just want to make sure you realize that you can't use the regular link to get on there. It's a private link. And in order to get that link, you got to make sure to uh, sign up so that you can be, you will send you the link to that. So this is going to be like a private, private concert for uh, all those who want to uh, want to join. There is no charge, but um, we wanted to keep it uh, exclusive. So you have to, you have to sign up and then we'll send you the, um, the link. So just want to make sure you know about that. And the class that's normally on Tuesday night is going to be on Wednesday night. Is that correct, Jeff? No, we uh, canceled it until the following week. Oh, oops. Okay. I stand corrected. Um, and so that's going to be a, be a, sh a short break from the Torah class. And we'll come back to it in um, the next week. Okay. Anybody have anything they would like to share? Just unmute yourself. If you have something you'd like to share. I have a question, Rabbi. Yes. And I apologize. I was in and out a little bit, so I might have missed it. When did the Rebbe's father pass away? What year? 1944. So where and where was he at that point? Was he in hiding or where was he? He was actually, um, he had been exiled to Kazakhstan because of his spreading of Judaism and keeping Judaism alive. So they, um, they let him have it and they threw him, they sent him off to uh, basically live a you know, very, very, very uh, difficult life. And ultimately it took his life. So sadly, uh, he actually, his, he had a five-year sentence, and um, it's so sad because he, it's so sad because he was free. He died in freedom. He didn't die in captivity. Hmm. He was freed, and, but he was so sick, and he, he couldn't make it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's a very, very, very tragic, yeah. Very, very sad. Okay. Well, uh, Rabbi, if, uh, if you don't mind, one, one addition. After serving your, your time, which, as you said, five years, right? In uh, Soviet, in that time, in Soviet Union, it was a practice that you have to live in exile and you're not allowed to go to certain big cities like Moscow, St. Petersburg, and so on and so forth. So he had to live in exile, even if uh, he considered to be free. He wasn't free because he had to uh, go to the police department and report, I think, once a month or um, every other week or something like that. So also, the war was uh, still going on. So it wasn't much he could do. <laughs> yes, no, so it absolutely it wasn't like he was free, free, but his sentence was done. That's that's more precisely said that he, um, 
his uh, the sentence was finished, and technically he could have gone to some city where or some place where he could have gotten better care. But by that time he was already uh, too sick and uh, didn't make it. So it's uh, but his but but his his optimism, his happiness, his joy, his uh, his view of life was um, was extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary, and he never saw what was happening to him as bad. Um, just uh, like I said, just an extraordinary human being, absolutely extraordinary. So that's today, a very, very special day on the uh, Chabad calendar. And now we're going to go to our Tanya that we've been studying. And for that, I'd like to share with you a prayer book that I have come to really enjoy and appreciate. And it's right here online. So I wanted you to know about this great treasure that we have right here. So it's called the online prayer book, and it goes through um, all, all the prayers with commentary. It has a table of contents, and I'm just going to point out one thing that uh, I found really fascinating, and this is the blessing that we say, and I think it's connected to what we learned in Tanya, a lot, a lot of this is. And this is the, the morning blessing that you say when you wash your hands. And so um, I'm not sure if any of you have asked me this question, but I've had this question many times, and that is the question of um, why do we say who has sanctified us with his commandments and commanded us concerning the washing of the hands, but in Hebrew it says nitilat yadayim. Nitilat means the taking of the hands, not the washing of the hands. So why don't we say al nikiat yadayim or shtifat yadayim, which is the way you say washing in Hebrew. The word netilat yadayim just doesn't seem to, to work. So why do we have that? Now, the reason why these are highlighted is I believe they are um, links to different explanations. So, I'd like to read this commentary with you because I found it to be really, really amazing and interesting to find out what is the, the significance behind the washing of the hands. So, concerning the washing of the hands, our sages ordained that one should wash his hands with water every morning and recite the blessing, al netilas yadayim, praising God for the midst of washing the hands. The rationale for this ordinance is explained by some as preparation for the morning recital of the Shema and Shemoneshri, for the hands are active, and it is likely that they touch unclean parts of the body during sleep. A second reason is explicitly stated by the Zohar, which was printed today for the first time in, was it 1558? And also mentioned in the Talmud, to remove the spirit of impurity that rests on the hands, resulting from the withdrawal of the soul's holiness from the person's body while he was asleep at night. The morning washing enables the person to sanctify himself in God's holiness by pouring pure water from a container just as a Kohen, a priest, in the Beit HaMikdash in the Holy Temple would sanctify his hands, washing from the basin. This is the reason our sages ordained the recitation of the blessing which states who sanctified us. Okay. Rabbi? Well, let's yeah. Rabbi? Yes. I don't, they're, they're sort of talking around the issue, but I think the idea is that you sort of die, you know, your soul goes away at night, and therefore you've been, you've touched with, you've, you're near death, and therefore you have to clean. Correct. Because, you, because you're impure. Correct, exactly. Of course, they're sort of talking around it there, but. Yeah, but that's, but you got the right idea, exactly. <laughs> Now, to focus on the parallel to this concept in our divine service, immediately upon arising from sleep, a person feels the material dimensions of his body to a much greater extent than during the course of the day. I don't know about you, but you wake up in the morning, that's when you feel how stiff you are and how, uh, oh, your back hurts and this hurts, you know? 
It's like you have to move around and everything starts, but you, so you feel your body much more. Therefore, at that time, he should endeavor to remove all the spiritual impurity that became attached to him during sleep. This endeavor within our souls is the counterpart of the washing of the hands in the morning. The blessing recited over this washing represents the soul's first steps out of the darkness of Kalipa that rests upon his body. It is in the initial preparatory stage for divine service. So it's not just we're washing our hands to make our hands clean, but we're actually trying to get our emotions in their right place. So now he goes a little further to explain this, and here it gets really beautiful. More particularly, the hands, which are used to interact with entities outside of oneself, that's what hands are for, represent the emotions. For emotions express one's feelings for someone or something outside of oneself. Intellect, on the other hand, is dispassionate. It is represented by clear, cool, and calm water. Within intellect itself, the analogy of water is applied in particular to the power of chokhmah. This washing is called nitila, which literally means removal. Because in doing so, one removes all the undesirable dimensions of the emotions, enabling them to be directed by the intellect, and more particularly, by the godly dimension of the intellect. So thus, the spiritual parallel of washing one's hands is drawing intellect down to the emotions. In our divine service, this refers to meditation before prayer. When a person is asleep, he is controlled by his animal soul. Upon awakening, this dimension of his soul begins to involve him with material concerns. This is the counterpart to the spirit of impurity that washing one's hands and the drawing down of intellect associated with it is intended to remove. In terms of our divine service, this refers to focusing on the general purpose of his life. In our sage's words, meditating on before whom one stands, raison d'être and carry out all his material affairs according to the Torah's directives. So... Rabbi? Yes. So this explanation is very beautiful, especially that last paragraph, but it sounds so Hasidic. Like what did non-Hasidic Jews, how did they relate to the word? What, what, what's the verb, anyway? Nitilah. What is it? Litol, litol. Litol. So how did they, how do non-Hasidic Jews explain the, the, the existence of the word litol in this prayer? Well, it could be they, they say it means removal of the impurity. To remove, remove. the impurity. Uh-huh. Just that, yeah. Right. But the, the, Hasidic, the Hasidic addition is that we are, we're trying to get the mind to influence the, the emotion, to, to give, to guide, to guide the emotions. And that to me was like, wow, I'm going to start thinking about, you know, I, I've always read that the mind and the hands interact. Okay, I'm back. Thank you for your patience. I do appreciate that. Just had to uh, take care of something. Someone just came by. And got all good. All good. So back to the washing of the hands. I always understood that the idea of washing of the hands was connected with the mind, uh, you know, affecting the heart. So when you wake up in the morning, you want to put the heart in the right place. You want to, you want to, uh, oh, I'm going to get, let's see if I can find this one. This is, uh, let me see if I can find this. That was very... Nice. Let me go to this. This is the um, the putting on the tefillin. See what it says here? Tying the tefillin straps is like leashing a dog. The Yetzer Hara. Once on a leash, 
he can be led wherever the master wants him to go. That's great, Rabbi. That is really cool. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it, it could be such a nice thing. You know, so it, it, there's really, um, I just found Rabbi, this. Rabbi, who's the master? The master is the, the godly it's, soul. Oh, so it's not the Yetzer Atov? And... Yeah, well, in this case, it is the Yetzer Atov, but the... You know, whoever the master is. So every every you know, the idea is that the the animal doesn't know what what's what's right and what's wrong. It needs a, a master to help it and and guide it. So um, the animating soul is uh, you know needs needs a leash to be to be directed and to be guided. So it's uh, again these are just such nice things here. Uh, while we're while we're here, you know. Uh, I'll share another one with you. This is about the uh, the talit. Um, where's the talit here? Uh, here it is. Nope. Next one. Nope. Nope. Uh -oh. Maybe it's here. Oh, well, I'll have to find it. But there's a very beautiful insight into the tzitzis. Oh, maybe it's here. No, not here. I will have to find it. I'm, I'm using a book. I don't use the online commentary uh, The uh, here online. So I'm using the actual book. So I know, I know where to find it in the book. I can't find it here. But let's go to what we are doing ourselves when we're up to in the Tanya. And that is that we are up to this section where we are discussing the, the blessings that precede the Shema. And so if you remember from last week's class, we were discussing why is it that we have these blessings preceding the Shema that really aren't blessings on the Shema. They're, they're separate from the Shema, which is why, according to Jewish law, if you forgot to say the blessing before the Shema, or you didn't have enough time to say the blessing before the Shema, you say them at the time you remember or when you can. So the, the issue is that when you, when you make a, let's say you put on your tefillin and you forgot to say the blessing on the tefillin, and then you took up your tefillin, you put them away, and it's late, later in the afternoon, you go, oh my gosh, I forgot to say the blessing on the tefillin. Do you say the blessing on the tefillin? The answer is no. You don't say the blessing on the tefillin. It's, it's, time has passed. It's over. So, so when do you say the blessing? Before. So if, you, if the blessings of the Shema have to be repeated, if you, or have to be said, forgot them, obviously they're unrelated to the Shema. So the question is, then why did the rabbis place them there, and why did they say these are the, they call it the blessings that precede the Shema? And the answer is that it's not the blessing on the Shema, it's the blessings that get you ready for the Shema because of the content. So there's something in the content of these blessings that really puts you in the right frame of mind. And when you say the Shema, you go, oh, now I know I, I'm, I'm in the right, I'm in the right, I'm in the right space. Now I've got to tell you, I have been. Uh, really enjoying my praying lately. And one of the things that I've been enjoying so much is figuring out or, or kind of getting in tune with that every part of the prayer is like a story. And you got to like kind of get yourself, like you get into character, you get, it, you get, in, you get into the, to the, to the story. And um, that's, that's the idea of, of real prayer. Is that it's an experience, it's not just reading words. It's like you're, you're, it's like you're there. You know, there's the, there's real stuff going on, and every part of it is is a story, and it's just a matter of finding the right commentary and and uh, and, and finding how how that is. So by this this uh, commentary that I found online, that I actually have the, the hard copy at, at home, um, and by other prayer books that I have that have a little bit of commentary there, 
little, little by little, it's emerging. This the stories are uh, are emerging, and so here also, there's a story going on here. What's the storyline? The storyline is that there's these angels, and the angels are, uh, you know, they're what are they saying? They're saying kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. They're saying that God is is very, very removed from them, and they're saying that where, where is God? God is found in this physical world. And the other angels turn and they say, God is, we don't even know where he is. And bless, bless is God wherever, wherever he is. And so we talk about the angel, and then we talk about how God then does, he, he doesn't, he could, he could easily connect with the angels. The angels appreciate God, uh, but he doesn't. He, he, he kind of says, the angels are not really my, my goal. They're not, they're not where I'm, where I'm, what I'm striving for. And so instead, the, he comes all the way down here and, and, and chooses us. And that's the next, that's the, the final, the second blessing of the Shema. And that gets us ready for the, that gets us ready for the Shema. So let's see it inside, what this blessing is. You have loved us with an everlasting love. You have bestowed upon us an abundant and exceeding measure of compassion. So now it's all talking about us. So before we were talking about the angels and how they're enthralled with God. But then it turns and we start talking about how, God, how much God loves us. Our Father, our King, for the sake of your great name and for the sake of our ancestors who trusted in you, whom you taught life-giving laws by which to fulfill your will wholeheartedly, be likewise gracious to us and instruct us. I'm going to add in a little bit of commentary here. And instruct us, even though we're not as worthy as they were. In other words, we're not like Abraham. We're not like Isaac. Okay, but, you know, please do the same for us. Our Father, merciful Father, who shows mercy, have mercy upon us, and implant understanding in our hearts, so that we may lovingly comprehend and perceive, listen, learn, and teach, observe, perform, and maintain all the words of the teachings of your Torah. In other words, the reason why we don't study Torah, and the reason why we don't uh, do the mitzvahs, is because we don't have understanding in our hearts, because of the tzimtzum. Because God created a tzimtzum, a confinement, he confined, he filtered the, his own light. And therefore, we can't experience and feel God's love for us. We can't experience how valuable the mitzvahs are to God. We can't appreciate how valuable the Torah is. We can't appreciate any of that. What we appreciate in this world is, how am I going to pay my bills? How am I going to be able to enjoy, enjoy my life? How am I going to take care of my health? These are the things that are real to us, and they are real. And, um, you know, so for the, for the Rebbe's father, what was real to him was his study. That was what was real to him. His physical existence was not as important as his spiritual existence. No question about it. So we ask God, if you'll help us, and, we, and we'll appreciate, and we'll be able to listen, learn, teach, observe, perform, and maintain all the words of the teaching of Torah, it will be much easier for us. And therefore we say, enlighten our eyes with your Torah, cause our hearts to cleave to your commandments, and unify our hearts to love and fear your name. And may we never be shamed or disgraced or falter. So basically what we're saying to, to God, we're saying... Open our eyes, open our hearts, open our minds. We want to, but you've created us in a way that makes it difficult for us to do this. Rabbi, I've got a question. Sure. So let's say God does this Simpson and people react differently to the Simpson. Some don't even notice that Hashem is present. Most of us, I guess, do. Uh, feel that. So if you're asking for God to open your eyes, are you asking Hashem to change the symptom or to change us? What would be the difference? 
either way, the symptom becomes less. I don't know. I just, I see the symptom as being something that is more concrete. You know, this, it's, it's, in other words, I'm trying to think is if, if the symptom. Jeff, can I help you? It's like the symptom is something that God is doing. And the understanding would be something that we're doing. Is that correct? Is that what you meant? Yeah, I, yes, yes, it, it is. I guess the, I mean, a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I thought that we did the symptom also to try to get to the point where we could have this level of understanding. In other words, if you're asking God to open our eyes, one of the ways I think that you can do that is by applying a little of that symptom and nullifying your own ego or animal soul in order to, in order, in order to better understand that. Okay, so I guess you're using the word. It's a little confusing. I'm sorry. I'm not making nope. my. No, no, not at all. Not confusing at all. But what you're saying is, symptom on my on my ego, put my ego in place, uh, put my, um, you know, my animal animating soul in its place. So I need to I need to put my my um, I need to put a. So I wouldn't. I don't know if I would call that a symptom. I would call that iskafia, which which is basically, it's called uh, impulse control. No wonder I've never heard of it. <laughs> so, impulse control is what we're really doing. So, um, that, that's really what you're what we're referring to what you're referring to. So when I'm putting my ego in check, it's basically the ego has gotten out of, out of it's, 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 um, it doesn't know its own, it's like, it's like a child. Okay. So, so the child needs to be taught, you know, the dog needs to be trained. The, uh, so, so the human being needs to be told, you know, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. The, the so the so the 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 ego gets a life of its own and it starts to take over and it's like whoa 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 hey whoa, whoa, you know calm down relax put yourself back you know where you belong um, I um, I came up with a quote and let me see if I can find that quote really quickly let's see. Go here, here. Quotes. You're not getting my quotes because you're not on my um, on my Instagram. So this is not this has not made it onto my Instagram yet, but hopefully it will soon. And it goes as follows. I can share this screen. There we go. So cool. There it is. Invest your soul into your relationships and your life, not your ego. So um, we need to we need to tell our ego where it belongs and where it doesn't belong. So I think that would be called more iskafia. You know, so um, tzimtzum is I, you know you you were you you were where you would use the term tzimtzum is when you want to teach your grandson or you want to teach your child or you want to teach your students and the idea you're going to give them is too much for them to handle. So therefore what you do is you give them a limited version of that information. That's called symptom. So I really, the teacher has a lot more to say and really, but it would blow the minds of the students. It goes right over their heads. So instead he gives them a, a, a less of it. He, he filters it, filters it down. That would be more of a symptom. 
So imagine this. Imagine you're sitting in front of a teacher and you're hearing the teacher and you're going, boy, this teacher is really holding it back. Now, if I tell the teacher to, 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 to just say it all, I know it's going to blow my mind. I'm not going to understand a word. So what, do I, what am I going to ask for? So what I would say is, please give me the ability to be able to comprehend and appreciate your, the deeper, what, what, what you really have to say. So don't blow my mind. Give me the capacity to be able to handle it. So I think that's really what the blessing, what the blessing is saying. Oh, in other words, open our eyes and make it that, that our eyes and our minds will be able to hear it rather than just, you know, just take away the symptom and blow us away. Well, what, what's that going to do? That's not going to help us. That makes a lot more sense. You can't handle the truth. Right. You can't handle it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's more the, 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 the idea here. We're asking God, please make it, you know, open our eyes, meaning give us eyes that, that would, would be able to see it. So that, there's nothing, there's nothing that a teacher wants more than for the students to want more than what they're getting. It's the same thing with any entertainer, right? So imagine you're, uh, you're performing at a concert and the concert's over and everybody's like, no, please, no more, no more music. We don't want any more. It's like, gee, thanks, that, that's great. But when everybody's clapping, encore, we want more, we want more, it's like, okay, that, that's, that's the right response, right? That's, that's what you want to hear. So the same thing a teacher, because you obviously, you know, the worst thing is when, you, when you've heard everything someone has to say and there's nothing left, which, you know, many times in relationships, that's what happens, right? So you, it's like, I've heard everything this person has, what has to say, you know, it's like, what, and no matter what they're going to say, I, I don't think I'm going to learn anything new, uh, which is what happens in life. Uh, where you have a mentor or you have a teacher or something like that, and then you kind of outgrow them because you kind of they don't, there's nothing new that they're saying. You, you've you've heard you've reached the depth of it, and when you reach sometimes you reach a teacher and you go, I'll I'll give you the example. My uncle Manus Friedman, for example. So I've been studying from him since I have been about 13 years old. So uh, that's uh, what 37 years uh, I've been studying from him. So you think that after a while, you know, I, I, I know everything he has to say, you know, and yet I listen to him and I'm going, oh, I've never heard that before. <laughs> where, where did he come up with that thing from? It's like, where in the, in the world did that come from? And there are other uh, rabbis that I've, that I've had over the time or, or people for that matter, wise, smart people that I've encountered and I still encounter. And it's like, I'm trying, trying to, to, to finally get them and I realize, wow, I finally got this part of them, but you know, there's another dimension behind them that that's that's, that's greater, and that's always the you know. Rabbi, certain... can I add? Can I add something? Sure. One time, you really, really impressed me. With one time, not that you don't impress me every day, but um, one time um, in the old days when we used to actually meet in at synagogue, and you showed up. And you said, you know, I've been thinking about this thing for several days, and it finally sort of clicked for me. And it was, you know, a new revelation for you. And that's, you know, and that's, and so you imp tried to impart it to us. And that's, that's what Manus Friedman is doing. And that's what, you know, real intellectuals do. Okay, I'm muting myself. No, no, that's, that's okay. It's, uh... No, so it's, yes, the, the idea is that um, you want, don't want to get bored with yourself. <laughs> it's like it's like I get bored of my of myself. It's like okay, let's 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 try to learn something new. Let me let me expand my my knowledge. Let me expand my my brain. Which um, you know, to to your point, uh, Jerry, it, uh, it's you know, sometimes. You know, you, you, you meet people who you used to have, uh, I don't want to say respect for, but you had a lot more in common. And then as time goes on, they kind of didn't really explore more. They're kind of still where they were before. And 
you're like you you moved past that, and it's just uh, it's hard. You know, it's uh, you know how do you how do you stay connected to those people? But that's that's the idea of constantly growing and constantly. Uh, so that's so that's the idea of of so so a student so a teacher wants the students to to be uh, that, like. By the way, one of the things that that I always like is when people ask questions. That that to me is very, very important as a teacher that the students ask questions. Why? Because I'm not teaching because, you know, just to get the kicks out of, you know, you know ta hearing the sound of my voice. It's, do you, do you want to, are you interested in what I have to share? And if you are interested in it, well, I surely didn't give you the full, the full picture. I, I, I'm just literally just starting to paint the picture for you. And if you're interested in what I'm, you're going to start asking questions. And so the questions really, to me, are that we're we're doing this together. You know, it's like you know, if if it if it, um, if, it if it upsets you or if it uh, tickles your brain or if it um, gets you thinking or something like that, it's like okay, good. <laughs> let's let's uh, let's engage. Let's let's talk about this. And so for me, the worst thing was always after I give a class and um, I say, is there any questions that we, no, there's no questions. Like, really? Is it? No, we're not going, there's nothing more, like, you know, nobody wants to know anything more about the subject. It's like, oh, I must have done something wrong. And so I realized I really need to teach in a way that, that brings the, the audience and brings the, you know, the people into the discussion. Otherwise, I'm not going to enjoy it. So... It's, it's this, it's this uh, you know, going to a deeper place. And to me, by the way, I did a, I did a Fabrengen last night for um, the Panama community. Rabbi Lane asked me to uh, do a little Fabrengen for them. So I, um, I got on there and they were, I, I did, it, was a, it was kind of a mixed, a mixed crowd. And uh, one, of the, one of the fellows there started asking some really, really good questions. And just, just by, by by having to think about them, it, it literally forced my brain to to come up with with uh, with new insights that I didn't even have before. And to me, it was like, okay, this was the best the best experience. And the same thing when I come to these classes, it's like I'm going to learn more from this from this than you guys are going to learn from this because of the challenges that, that I get. Which I love the challenges. Uh, it's not because that's that's what um, causes me to learn to learn more, and I always want to be learning learning more. So the symptom is, you know, and, and, and the, what you want back from that symptom is, could you please take away that symptom? Could you please, you know, give us more? We want more. And so that's the idea of this prayer that we're saying is that as much Torah as we know and as much mitzvahs as we're doing, we realize that it's nothing close to what it could be. And please give us more. We want more. We want more. Encore. Give us more. That's the that's the idea. So let me go back to that prayer book. Where were we? There we go. Okay. Now, we for we have placed our trust in your holy, great, and awesome name. May we celebrate and rejoice in your salvation. So why are we thinking that we deserve your salvation? Not because of anything great we've done, but simply in the fact that we've trusted you. So that's our claim to fame, that we, are, we trust you. And that should be our, the, the, the cause of our salvation. May your mercy, O oh God, our Lord, and your abundant kindness never forsake us. Hasten and speedily bring us blessing and peace. Okay, so we started off by asking God for that he should have compassion on us and uh, be nice to us like he was to our forefathers. We ask him to open our eyes to the Torah and to the, our hearts to the mitzvahs. And then we ask that God should bring us salvation, bring us home, bring us back. May your mercy, O God, our Lord, in your abundant kindness never forsake us. Hasten and speedily bring us blessing and peace. Bring us in peace from the four corners of the world. So bring us from the four corners of the world. And um, 
break off the yoke of the nations from our necks and speedily lead us upright to our land. For you are God who brings about acts of salvation and you have chosen us from all nations and tongues. So bring us home and bring us from the four kanfos haaretz. It's very interesting. The word in Hebrew is kanfos. The, the singular is kanaf. Now, in the in the uh, blessing of the of the Shema, in the Shema itself, there's three sections, and the third section talks about the tzitzis, the talit, and it says that you shall place on the four al hakanaf on the corner tacheles. You should put tacheles there. You should put the tzitzis on the corner. Now, in Hebrew, the word kanaf also means clothing. It doesn't just mean corner, it means clothing. And it says that when Mashiach comes, lo yi kanef od morecha, that God, your teacher, will no longer be hidden from you. He will no longer be wearing all that tzimtzum, all that, that, that filtering, to filter out all of that. But instead, you're going to uh, be able to see God without any filters. And we are told that when we put on our tzitzis and we wear the talit, what we're doing is we're trying to hasten the time when there will be no more filter between us and God. That's another angle into the significance of the wearing of the talit and the tzitzit on the corner. And so, what should you do? Bring us home. Why? For you are God who brings about acts of salvation. You have chosen us from all nations and tongues. So you chose us. It was your choice, not our choice. So we're not saying anything about us. We never said that we deserve anything. We said do it for, before we said uh, do it like you did it for our fathers, not because we, we deserve it. And then we said uh, because we trusted in you. Right? That's why you should, uh, that's why we should get the salvation. And why should you uh, bring us home and take off the, the yoke of the nations from our necks? Because you chose us. Not, nothing to do with us. It has to do with your choices. This, 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 is, this, is, this is to you. And now, he says, and you, our king, have lovingly brought us close to your great name. Now, this is, in here, when you read this, you're supposed to have in mind that when God brought us close, when did God bring us close? At the time of the giving of the Torah. So at this point in the prayer, you're supposed to think about that we're standing at Mount Sinai. And then he says, your great name. He brought us close to his great name that we should remember that there were, there's a group of people that are trying to destroy God's name. They're called Amalek, that they don't want God's name. So we're supposed to remember to destroy Amalek. And then we say, so that we may thankfully acknowledge you, proclaim your oneness, and love your name. So love, as opposed to when the idol worshipers made the golden calf, and so the, the love is coming to say that not like the Jews who, who sinned at the golden calf. And then to proclaim your oneness and not like Miriam who spoke the words of, uh, of Lashon Hara, of gossip against Moses. So right in here, we're supposed to be thinking about all of those things. Just in these little few words, we're supposed to have these things in mind. So brought us close is the giving of the Torah. Your great name is remembering Amalek. Love is, um, is that not like when they, with the golden calf and proclaim your oneness as opposed to proclaiming, uh, you know, saying things that are gossip or things like that. Rabbi, can I ask something? Sure. How do you know all that? Is that the commentators? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
This is why the, the prayer book that we have is so poor. Look at, look at how much I just gave you. Uh, this is not everything. I'm just giving you a little bit of what's inside this, this prayer, which is why I recommend it for Jeff or others. I put in the email about that prayer book that has these this commentary in it. So uh, if you could order that book. It'll... And it quotes the commentators. Yeah, as a, uh, again, it just it doesn't, doesn't quote where it's from. I don't know if it quotes where it's from, but uh, it puts in all of these little things into, into it. And we conclude, blessed are you God who chooses his people of Israel with love. Okay, now we're going to go to the, now that we've gotten ourselves clear on this, right? So God chose us from all the nations, brought us close to his great name with love so that we could proclaim his oneness and love his name. And thank you, God, for choosing his people, Israel, with love. So that is the way we get ready for the Shema. So now let's look into the Tanya. So what does he say here? Thereby we will understand the true reason and meaning of the rabbinical enactment ordained of the, the recitation of the blessings of the Shema to preceding it. For it would appear at first glance, they know what, no connection whatever with the recital of the Shema. As Rajba and other codifiers have stated, why then were they termed blessings of the Shema? And why were they ordained to be recited specifically before it? And the answer is because we have love that conflicts with the love of God. We have love of ourselves, we have love of our children, love of our spouse, love of our money, love of our life. We have all these, we have all these different things that can get in the way. And the job is to make all of those things a part of our love with God. So we love God and through that our wife. We love God and there through that we love ourselves. We love God and through that we love our children. We love God and through that we use our money in the right way. And through that we use our materialism in the right way. So that's the idea of um, of the Shema is to transform the love and bring it around. But how can physical man attain to this level? It is therefore to this end that the blessing of Yotzer was introduced first. For in this blessing there is said and repeated at length the account and order of the angels standing at the world's summit in order to proclaim the greatness of the Holy One, blessed be He. All of them are nullified in His blessed light and pronounce in fear and, sancti and sanctify and declare in fear, holy, meaning that God is apart from them. And God does not clothe Himself in diem, in a revealed state. But the whole earth is full of his glory, namely the community of Israel above and Israel below, as has been explained earlier. And so, two, the Ophanim, the holy Chayot, with great thunder, declare, blessed be the glory of the place of the Lord from his place, that they neither know nor do they apprehend this place, as we say, for he alone is exalted and holy. Then follows a second blessing, with an everlasting love, you have loved us, O Lord our God. That is to say that he set aside all the supernal holy hosts and caused his Shashina to dwell on us, so that he be called our God, in the same sense that he is called the God of Abraham, as explained earlier. This is because love impels the flesh. So even though it's very difficult for God, in a sense, to make this contraction and this filtering of himself, he, had, he does it because of how much he loves us. Therefore, it is called Ahavat Olam. For this is the so-called contraction of his great and infinite light, taking on the garb of finitude, which is called Olam. So the reason why the world is called Olam is because Olam means to limit, to hide, to make finite, to contract. So the word Olam which is a, the other word for world, is actually describing the spiritual per, um, uh, portions, particulars, properties of, of this world. But this is not a world of revealed godliness. This is a world where God has to hide himself for the sake of the love of his people Israel. So since God doesn't want to destroy us, therefore he hides if he were to reveal himself, we would stop existing. 
in order to bring them near to him. So therefore, he doesn't want us just to exist and not be close to him. No, he wants us to exist and then we'll become near to him. That they might be absorbed in his blessed unity and oneness and not disappear, not be destroyed, but be, a, be ourselves, be a distinct from God and yet be absorbed in God's unity and oneness. This is also the meaning of with great and exceeding pity have you pitied us, namely exceeding the nearness of God towards all the hosts above. So it's in contrast to how close God is to the angels, that's how much he is close to us. So it's, they, he's not close to them, but he is close to us. And you have chosen us from every people and tongue. And I said we were going to talk about this this week, so I guess, I guess we better get to it. Which refers to the material body, which in its corporeal aspects is similar to the bodies of the Gentiles of the world. Okay, so let's, let's stop and reflect on this for just a moment. So you have chosen us from among the people, from every people and tongue. Why did God choose us over everybody else? Did he choose us because of some kind of a superiority that we have to others? I think he offered it to everybody else first, Rabbi. Right. Exactly. So did he choose us because of that? Right. So that would be the that would be a a, a, um, a simple a simple argument that he, uh, he asked Rabbi, everybody. Else. Yeah. I think. I've heard we're not the chosen people, we're the choosing people. Go ahead. What does that mean? We chose. We did the, in other words, we, we said, okay, we'll do it. Right. So here in this, in this uh, blessing, we keep on saying that you chose us. God chose us. Right. But we, ch we chose to accept the choo the ch choose, his choosing. R true. But if God didn't choose us, our choosing would be meaningless. So we didn't create the relationship. We just accepted it. Right. That's very different than we creating it. So that's the... That's but what's funny, what's funny about that, if you really, if you take that to, and I agree with that, but if you take that forward, then... You have to you have to recreate the relationship going forward because otherwise you're going to be uh, you 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 know your eyes aren't going to be open your ears aren't going to be open and you're not going to even know about it. So yeah, you're the chosen people, and God chose you. But then going forward, you have to choose to be responsible for that or even recognize it because it's very easy not to. Yeah, we have a lot of responsibility now. Absolutely. But, but the choosing of us is what started the relationship. Right, but now, then, we, then we agreed to be, the part, be a partner. Right, so, so let's, let's think of it this way. What are we most proud of? That we chose God or that God chose us? I think that God chose us. Right, that's much more impressive than the fact right. that we chose God. I, I could choose anything. <laughs> I'm not that important. God is much more important, so my choice wait, is that. Wait, wait, wait. I want to argue for the other position. Second, I know. I was thinking before. that, too. I was thinking that, too. But oh, you know, muted yourself, Rita. No, I, I said I was thinking along those lines, too. But Jerry's first. Go ahead. One second. Let me, let me just finish the point, and then, then, we'll, then I want to hear both of yours. Now, what, what is God more impressed with? His choice or our choice? What is, what is he, what is he going to brag about? Obviously. Oh, look, at me. Uh, Obviously. look at me. I chose the Jewish people. No, look, they, they, they accepted. So if you're looking at it from God's perspective, he's like, which is why we find that we refer to the holiday of Passover as Passover, and God refers to it as the holiday of the matzah. Why? Because we're saying, look, God came to us and he skipped over their homes and took us out of Egypt. Wow, that's, that's impressive. And God is saying not, oh, look at me, I, uh, I, I saved the Jews. Look, look at them, they trusted me and they took their matzah and they, and they went into the desert. 
it, 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 it's, this is them. It's, it's all, you know, that's the, that's the beauty of the relationship. So we always po- focus on the fact, which is why in our tefillin, we talk about, you know, uh, you should love the Lord your God. What does it say in God's tefillin? Love the Jewish people. So, so it, it, you know, obviously from, from which perspective, uh, you know, we're looking at it. So yes, obviously our choice is valuable. On Rosh Hashanah, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the things that we, that we sing is, Koy uh, Amar Hashem, so says the Lord, Zacharti lach chesed I remember the love of when you were young. Lach tech acharai bamidbar. You followed me into the desert. Oh, you guys were such, so, were so you loved me so much. I, 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 I'll never forget it, and I'm so proud of it. I tell everybody how impressed I am that you guys followed me out into, uh, into the desert. Right? So we say that in Rosh Hashanah. So obviously God is very, very proud of us. But we don't walk around going, oh, look at us. We, we follow God into the desert. No, look at us. God took care of us in the desert. So, so we're focusing on what Hashem does for us. That's impressive to us. And God is like, whoa, I'm not, that's not talking about me. Look at how impressive they are. They're, they're so impressive. So those are the two parts. So they're both true. While they're both true, we would rather focus on the fact that God chose us because that's, that speaks volumes of how valuable we are. If, if, if I chose God, okay, how, how, how valuable could that be already compared to God choosing me? Well, he's God. So if God is choosing me, that's, uh, I'm, gonna put, I'm putting that on my resume, you know? In fact, I want to put something on my resume. Uh, God chose me. Um, uh, that says it all, you know? Uh, so what does it mean that God chose us? Why did he choose us? So if God chose us for something that we did, because we chose him, then we're back to square one. It's not because God likes us. It's because there's something about us that God likes. Does that make any sense? No. No? I thought, I thought the opposite. I thought that God offered offered the 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 uh, option to everybody. To me, it makes sense because if if it's the way that you just said, then it's conditional. Right. Not only is it conditional, but it's very limited. So let's say God likes my uh, he likes you know. Um, he likes my card collection, you know, or my, uh, my, my choice of, uh, of, of, of colors, you know, he likes that. It's like, okay, fine. But if God loves me, for me, not because of anything that I've done, okay, that's, that's, that's much, much greater. So if you're loving me for something that I've done, then the love is limited to that thing, right? So if you marry now someone, you sound like your uncle. Right, exactly. So the so the idea is if you marry someone for their money, if you're marrying them for their money, everybody recognizes and says, ah, oh, that's uh, yeah, don't marry them for their money. That's that's not valuable. That's not nice. Marry them for their uh, because they're going to take care of me. Yeah, not not not. That's not. It's not the proper way. So then why should we marry each other? <laughs> the answer is, I just need to be with you. You're, you're the, I need to be with you. Oh, then my value is much, much greater than the thing that I offer. And therefore, not only is it conditional, but I'm afraid. If, let's say, in other words, you married me because I was going to take care of you. You married me for my money. You married me for my health. You married me because, and then I can't take care of you. I lost all my money. That's it. I don't love me anymore. There's also, I married you for your love, which is another thing he goes into. Good. I married you for, because I need love or, or, or whatever it is. But the, but the point is, as soon as the love stops, as soon as the money stops, so then what, what is there to love? Okay, well, I found something else to love. You know, you have a good sense of humor. Oh, uh, or I found something else about you that, uh, you know, you're really thrifty and you, you don't spend a lot of money. Or you know how to make good deals, or you know how to go on Amazon, and you know how to use the internet. Like this, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is a very embarrassing if that's if that's how the relationship is going. So 
when we say that God, yeah, Michael. Oh, I'm sorry. I I I, I didn't want you to, to, to. I didn't want to interrupt you. But I think we are losing the 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 point because uh, well, if God chose us or we chose God for what? Well, what what is the reason of this uh, process choosing, right? And that's and that's important thing because. God chose us and gave us Ten Commandments and then gave us Torah and then gave us 613 uh, mitzvot. And, uh, so we are much more controlled after that than the rest of the, 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 the effort population. So it's, it's not a prize we won. It's, uh, it's some, it, 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 there is a reason for this. Chose, right? But why did he choose? That? No, what he you're, what you're describing is what he chose us for. So he was yes, looking, and that's and that's my main question: what he chose us for? <laughs> because that's right. important. That's, that's right. That's the second question. But the first question is: so for whatever he was looking for, why did he choose us? Well, uh, if if we answer the question why he chose us for, <laughs> well, we, what he chose us for, probably we will answer the question why he chose us, not the, 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 the... He was looking for a wife. He was looking for a spouse. He was looking for a nation. He was looking for, for someone who he could have a relationship with, someone he could share his mitzvahs with, someone he could share his Torah with. Exactly. Okay, so why did he choose us? Well, because we accepted it. <laughs> because we, and we followed, and even uh, after, well, several days we started uh, going astray, he showed us that uh, the, the reason for this, uh, um, for, for being chose, is that the, they established a connection. and. And well, we, I think we agreed on that. Is it that we agreed or is it that we're intrinsically connected? So that's exactly what Dr. Rebbe is saying here. That's exactly what he's avoiding, we're trying to get us to think differently. And he's saying this again, it's not about the Rebbe's a novel idea. This is, this is shared in other places in the Torah. But the Alter is putting it all together in this beautiful way. And that is that the choice that God made was not for our soul, but as he says here, you have chosen from every people and tongue refers to the material body, which in its corporeal aspects is similar to the bodies of the Gentiles of the world. Therefore, there was, it's not because we said yes, because that was not our bodies. Our bodies didn't say yes. It was our souls that said yes. And by the way, we have a godly soul, and therefore the godly soul obviously is more connected to God than, uh, than, than anything else. But that's not where the choice came from. When we say that God chose us, it means he chose our body, which means that there was no difference. There's no difference, vis vis visible difference, or even non-visible difference between the body of a Jewish person and a non-Jewish person. So there was no benefit. There was nothing that you could look at and see and say, ah, this one is better than that one, so I'll choose that one. And that's because there's levels of choice. And that's what we wanted, I want to discuss with you this time, and, and we'll see if we can explore this together. There's different levels of choice. There's choice because something is more valuable. There's choice because something is more personal. So, when it comes to more valuable, you look at the differences. When you talk about personal, differences don't matter. You're taking personal. You're choosing personal. So, with regards to the godly soul, God is choosing the benefits. So, that's the kind of choice there where there's a difference. When it comes to the body, that's the real choice. This is a choice that's personal as opposed to beneficial. 
What does that mean? Your child could look and act the same as somebody else's child. Why are you choosing your child over the other person's child? Are you choosing your child because they're smarter, because they're cuter, because they're more capable, because they're uh, going to be, uh, you know, going to turn into a really great person, or are you choosing them because they're personal? It's your kid. That's why you're choosing them. So, which part of you is choosing the child? The answer is the essence of me is choosing my child. Now, when I'm in a classroom and I'm trying to, or if I'm on a project and I'm uh, an engineer and I'm trying to put together the best team to build the next, uh, you know, inventive, whatever invention that we're working on, there I'm looking for benefit. I'm not looking for personal. I'm looking for beneficial. And so I look for talent. I'm looking for who said yes, who's accepting, who's smartest, who has the best qualities that we're looking for. I'm not looking, so that's not, that's also choosing, but it's not real choice, because it's not the essence is choosing, it's whatever context is choosing. So if I'm trying to, to make a basketball team, I'm gonna look for people who are, uh, you know, more than six feet tall. And you are, uh, Rabbi, you wouldn't pick the Jewish people if you want to pick a basketball team. <laughs> the, the, the early basketball team, basketball. I know, I know. Word, but uh, yes, you, you would want, if you're looking for people who are good runners, you want to, you know, you want to go to uh, certain places in Africa that have uh, really good runners and uh, different places have different, different qualities. And so if you're, looking for, if you're looking for qualities, you're trying to accomplish something. So if God is trying to accomplish something, he wants to make the world better. So go find the people who are the best at making the world better. You know, go, go get, go get good, good, uh, good engineers and go pick them out from everywhere. And many times God gets very frustrated, like we're reading in the Torah portion. God is very frustrated with the Jewish people. It's amazing in last week's Torah portion how he talks about the Jewish people. Yes. So, so here's the, this is, I don't know if this is true, but give me your reaction to this. So he picks us because of the personal relationship, right? Because it's my kid as opposed to somebody else's kid. So I'm picking this kid. But then I expect that kid to do something with that relationship. So then they apply the skills and the, and the, and the willingness to go out and to reciprocate that relationship. Right. So obviously I want a relationship with my child. That is my, that's, that's what I want. And not only that, I want an adult relationship with that child. And uh, eventually I want the, you know, if we, if we go to the marriage analogy, I want to be, uh, you know, intimate with that, uh, not, not child, but it's, it's uh, with, with this person. So I'm choosing as a spouse. Did you ever, did you ever think of, <laughs> sorry, did you ever think of Galut, Galut is exile, right? Did you ever think of Galut as a way of God kicking us out of his house? No, that's what it says. Oh, it that's does? It. I was yeah. making a joke. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we were, we were kicked out of the house. <laughs> no, that's, it's clear. No we, idea. We were thrown out of the house. We were used to be in his house, and he threw us out. That's great. Yes, we're in Michael. Time out! Time out! <laughs> for for two thousand years, we're kicked out of the house. You know? A long one. But 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 Rabbi, uh, Egyptians also were his uh, his kids, right? No, why not? Well, again, they're his creation. Yes. So creation doesn't make you a, doesn't make you personal. Uh, where where in the in the timeline this distinction happens at ever or even earlier? Very good question. So when does this is a God, very good question. When does God choose the Jewish people? The answer is before He created the world. Wow. Wow. Well, by, by definition, if the Torah was written several thousand years before the creation of the world, he would have had to have chosen us already. Right. The Jewish Ooh. people are the chosen people in the Torah 
and the Torah precedes the world. Right. But then the question is, one second. So then the Talmud asks this question. Who comes first, the Torah or the Jews? Well, if, you know, there are two ways to answer that, right? The Torah, if, the you know, Torah if they, comes before the world, right? The Torah Everybody. comes before the world, but the Jews had to exist in order for the Torah to be written. Right, because in the Torah, God writes, speak to the Jewish people. Right. So, they, so the Jews had to exist before. So obviously we existed not in a physical sense. We existed in conception. In other words, the, the concept of us, in other words, that God had this idea that he's going to have a people called Israel. He's going to have, he's gonna, he basically, he's going to, you know, he has a vision for his life. And that life consists of uh, he's going to get married and uh, he knows who he's marrying. So we're the so immaculate is, conception. I get it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's, that's the fundamental idea that uh, for six days, only material world was created. So godly world existed uh, as long as God existed, which means indefinitely, mm -hmm. forever. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. That's, 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 that's wow. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. That's a big wow. That, uh, so, so therefore, that's why we go back to the word, the choosing people. God already chose us way, way, way before the world was even created, before the, even the Torah existed. God, God already in a sense, we were the chosen people. And it's because... We had to wake up to it. What was that? We had to wake up to it. Right. So that's why it took till Abraham to, to wake up to it. So in other words, Adam, by the way, Adam is born Jewish. He has a Jewish soul inside of him. But when he eats from the, from the tree, that part of his Jewishness goes into hiding. There's a tzimtzum on that part. And the first one to take it out of that tzimtzum was Avraham. So Avraham is recognizing a truth. He didn't create a connection between him and God. He uncovered the relationship that he has with God. Wow, the same happens with the kid. Well, the kid is born. He just has to remember what was already. Correct. <laughs> yeah, at the moment of the birth, he just forgets. Correct. And he needs uh, some slaps. <laughs> exactly. He needs a refresher course. Yes. Wow. Exactly. So while we're, so again, it is impressive that we figured it out, that we uncovered it. That's impressive because God did a very good job of hiding himself and hiding this reality from us that we give Abraham tremendous credit. Wow, he figured it out. He uncovered the truth. It's like when people, it's like, who discovered uh, electricity? Yeah. Thomas Edison, who was it who discovered it? No, 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 much, much before that. It was a cool honor. It, even the Asian Greeks, they knew that. Yeah, the Torah also, knew. Yeah, also, Torah also knew it, yeah. But I'm right. saying, who credited it with modern-day electricity? Thomas Edison. Yeah. Thomas Edison. But he didn't, he didn't invent it. All he did was he uncovered it. He yes. discovered it. The all, everything that we have in this world, whether your name is Elon Musk or your name is Jeff Bezos or your name is, uh, you know, Bill Gates or, or your name is, um, uh, who is the... Uh, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, Albert Einstein. Uh, Louis, Pasteur. Huh? <laughs> Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur. All these people, they didn't, they didn't create anything. All they did was they discovered something. They discovered something that was already there. But they get the Nobel Peace Prize or the Nobel whatever prize because of, uh, of their discovery. Because they discovered it. So it's, they, they don't, same thing with, with, with our Judaism. We just, we just discovered it. We didn't create it. 
We didn't choose God. We discovered that we are the chosen people. Ah, for that you get credit. You get the Nobel Prize for discovering the, the atom. You, you, you get the Nobel Prize for uncovering a truth that nobody else knew about before. Very good. That's what you get. And that's very impressive, by the way. It's not, 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 it's not a joke. It's a very serious thing. So God is proud of us. Look, you get the Nobel Prize. You, you discover that who you really are. It's, you know, my mazel tov. But what did we discover? We discovered that we were the chosen people. That's what we discovered. That we have a Jew. We have that. that uh, so God chooses us because we have a godly soul. But that's not an essential choice. That's a lower level choice. And therefore, if you go against your godly soul, based on that, you could be cut off from the Jewish people, which is what happened to, uh, to Jewish people before the Torah was given. You could cut yourself out. But once the Torah, once the Jewish people reached a certain level and that the, the God's choice of us was revealed on an essential level, now you cannot leave. No matter what you do, you don't lose that essential connection because it had nothing to do with your soul. It had nothing to do with, your, with, with anything that you were doing. It had everything to do with personal. This is personal. And if you read last week's Torah portion, it's interesting in the dialogue between God and Moses and the Jewish people sin at the golden calf. So it starts off like this. God says to Moses, Go down because your people have failed. Your people have made a moral, uh, you know, they, 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 they've broken the cardinal rule. And you know how they, that Torah portion ends? God says, Moshe, Moshe turns back to God and says, they're your people. <laughs> it's just, a, it's just a, it, you just read it. It's just beautiful. Your children. <laughs> I was going to say, look, look at what your son did. Exactly. Right. So you're 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 pinning it on me. They're my people. They're not my people. They're your people. They're, they're they're God's people. So and that's and that's where he gets the forgiveness. In other words, what God is saying is, hey, based on their godly soul, they forfeited their their portion. They're out because a godly soul can be thrown in the. You know, you can basically disconnect from your godly soul, but. The, the choice wasn't from the godly soul. The choice was much, much deeper than that. It came because of personal. Now, where do you see that it was personal? How do you see that this was a personal choice, not a beneficial choice? The answer is, in the body is the, is the place where the essential choosing is done. Which is why you choose your child, why God creates a child, when, they're, when you're born, you have zero talent, zero visible qualities. Your ability to think is not invisible. Your ability to see, you can't see. Your ability to do anything is not visible. And therefore, you connect to the child. See, if, if the child came out and he was already speaking and already could play piano and he already, was, uh, already had his, uh, you know, his acceptance to Harvard and Yale, Say, oh wow, this, this kid is this kid is impressive. I'm impressed with this kid. I mean, it's like this is unbelievable. Uh, I can't wait to tell everybody about it. Look, this kid already comes out with his diploma, you know, he's ready, he's ready, he's already graduated. But when but the way God can, and by the way, other animals, that's the way they come other out. Anim, other animals come out knowing stuff. They can walk, right. they can exactly. eat. Exactly. They're impressive. Yeah. They're impressive when they're born. Right. The human baby is unimpressive. It's the most unimpressive baby in the entire part. By the way, of I read a scientific study years ago about how babies are born with one ability that, that, that um, expresses itself very early on, which is the ability to smile at their parent. If they didn't do that, then after a while, the parent would have a difficulty relating. Like, it's, it's so connecting that ability to smile. That's Jerry, it's not, it's not smiling, it's just gas. <laughs>
But but even the smile takes a while. You don't. They don't. It smile takes a while. Born. It's a couple of months. Right? Right? They don't, they're not born smiling. No. And neither is the mother smiling when that baby is born. Either. <laughs> you know, it's it's not a smiling moment. So this kid can't do anything for himself. I'm in pain. It's like, what in the world is there to connect me to this child? And the answer is, it's mine. That's the only thing that connects us to the child is, it's personal. This is my kid. That's it. And that's the only thing. And that's, so it's the same thing, personal. And the same thing with the child choosing the parents. The child doesn't know anything about the parent when the child is connecting to the parent. And thank God for that, because if the child knew what the parent was like, he may say, hey, I don't want this parent, but they don't know any better. So they just connect to the parent from this place of they can't see what the parent looks like. They don't understand what the parent is, but they have this connection with the parent because the parent loves the child back, loves the child, and the, the baby feels the love. And if the child is not loved, there, that child will have consequences later on if they did not experience love at the very first moment when they're born and they're being fed. We don't have the Dr. Alita Coleman on right now, but she is the expert on that and discovered that, that the child is looking for a connection with the parent the moment it's born. At the moment of birth, it's looking for that connection and it wants that connection desperately. And if it doesn't get it, it could have it could have issues uh, involved with food for the rest of its life. That's how powerful that first moment is. And if the mother is distracted, or if she's in pain, or if she's uh, just not in the mood, or whatever it is, and that child is not getting it, it could affect the child years and years and years of their life with uh, with, with the with, with food related issues. And so this is the power. So how does the child connect to the parents? They don't know anything about the parents. Doesn't know what the parents' value is, what their talents are, whether they have a degree, they don't have a degree, whether they can read, whether they can speak, whether they're, whether they're, even, whether they're even sighted, whether they even have the ability to see or the ability to speak. They have none of that. And yet, and that's the moment when they connect with their parents. Because the parent-child connection, what, that, what God wants to create is an essential connection with them rather than a, a, a connection that's based on some kind of a talent, value, or benefit analysis. And, so, and that is the idea of the choosing of God of the Jewish people in their body. So we're saying that the choice is not a choice that is connected with some kind of benefit. It is connected with our essence and with that we are past the nine o'clock hour and um this has been a joy absolute joy we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to pick this up next week because um this is just delicious delicious stuff absolutely delicious thank you so much thank you, rabbi. Thank you, rabbi. you're very welcome thanks for sticking out for two hours you guys are amazing thank you Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Rabbi. Very good. Take care. We'll see Thank you tomorrow you. night. See you tomorrow. Yes, we're so excited. Yes. <laughs> Ellie Marcus. Thank you, Rabbi. Hey, Jeff. Good to hear you. <laughs> okay, everybody. Have a good night. Love you all. See you Thank next. You. See you tomorrow night. Thank you again. You're welcome. Thank you, Jill. Good to see you, or have you. Thank you. <laughs> We're here every Monday night.